You are listening to a sermon from Village Baptist Church in Petaluma. For more sermons like this one, please visit our website at villagebaptisthome.org. Our mission is to win people to Christ and develop them into active disciples. We pray this sermon is a blessing to you. Now let's hear today's message. So in February of 2020, I was in the middle of a series called Jesus Over Everything, which is studying the book of Colossians. And, uh, and then the pandemic hit and they said, you got to take a break. So we went and I said, I don't want to preach to the camera during this series because I thought we'd be back because, you know, two weeks to flatten the curve. Well, we know how that went. Uh, so, so in the middle of the pandemic, I thought, you know what, I... I I want to be my first sermon back in the building to be in Colossians. So we're just going to pick right back up where we were a year ago, more than a year ago. And I know you all remember where we stopped, right? Absolutely, Absolutely right? <laughs> and you know, remember what the book of Colossians is about, right? Of course not, because I don't even remember. Um, so Colossians is a book written by the Apostle Paul. And the interesting thing about this book is that he had never been to this church. He didn't plant it. A man named Epaphras, he planted this church. He was a disciple of Paul. And so when he planted this church, um, it was going well. The gospel was growing. Fruit was being born. But then, as what always happens, people start coming in and start saying things that they shouldn't be saying. So there's a group that came in, and they began to tell them, you don't need Jesus only you need Jesus plus a few other things. You need Jesus plus maybe angel worship. You need Jesus plus uh, visions. You need Jesus plus some of the Jewish customs. And Paul came in and said, no, Jesus is supreme over everything. You need Jesus only. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And so when we left off last, Paul was talking about the community of faith and how because of what Christ has done in us and for us, because we're hidden in him, there's a certain way that we're supposed to act and conduct ourselves. And that's where we left off in verse uh, 15 of Colossians. So Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14. Actually, let's start in verse 15. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I want to tag this text, is it in you? Is it in you? 1965, the assistant coach for the Florida Gators hired some researchers to figure out why his team kept falling to heat-related illnesses. So he grabbed four doctors and they went into a lab to figure out what it was. And what they found out was that when the players were playing and practicing, that they were losing two things. One, they were losing water and electrolytes and they weren't being replenished. They also learned that they had been losing carbohydrates and they weren't being replenished. And so they came up with this formula, with this drink to help them to be able to replenish this this thing. And they called it Gatorade. And it became a big thing, collegiate sports, pro sports. And Gatorade has this slogan, is it in you? And what they're saying is, if this product is not in you, then you won't be effective in what you're called to do as an athlete. I think the Apostle Paul would say the same thing to us this morning. Is it in you? Is what in you? The peace of Christ, the word of Christ. If the peace of Christ and the word of Christ are not in you, you won't be effective as a follower of Jesus. And if the peace of Christ and the word of Christ is in you, then what should come out of you? Gratitude. So that's where we're going this morning. The peace of Christ, the word of Christ, and if those two things are in you, then what should come out of you is gratitude, and then we'll go to lunch, all right? So first, peace of Christ. 
Let's look at it again. Verse 15, he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. If you've been a Christian for a while, you've probably heard someone say something like, I just don't have a peace about it. And what they're talking about is there's this idea in the Christian world that a way for you to know what God's will is for your life is to figure out if you have a peace about it. So if you have a peace about it, then that means God is wanting you to do it. Here's the problem with that. One, that's not what Paul is saying here. In fact, a lot of people say that's what Paul is saying. If, if you have a peace about it, that means that God's calling you to do it. It's not necessarily true. Just because you have a peace about something doesn't mean it's God's will. We all know that you can have a peace about something you have no business doing. I know how many times somebody bring me their boyfriend and, and say, yeah, he, this is my boyfriend. And that my first question always, is he saved? And they always say, well, he knows how to spell God. I mean, he's, he's so, and then we spell it, babe, spell God. He, listen, just because somebody says that they are a believer doesn't mean that they are. And a lot of you, you know you know they're not, but they're cute. <laughs> you ever been at a party? You're supposed to be on a diet. You know you're supposed to be on a diet. There's a piece of cake there. You're eating the cake, and somebody comes up to you, and they say, hey, man, you shouldn't be eating that cake. You're supposed to be on a diet. He's like, ah, but I have a piece about it. <laughs> so just, just cut me another piece, because I have a piece about it, right? You can have a piece about something you shouldn't have no piece about. Remember Jonah? God said, go to Nineveh. He said, Nineveh, yeah, right. Got on a boat, was on his way, a storm hit, the, the uh, sailors are screaming, ah, where's Jonah? <sighs> Dreaming about cotton candy. He has no problem. You can have a peace about something that you shouldn't. And then the flip is, is, is true also. You can not have a peace about something that you really should be doing. Remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, Lord, look. <laughs> I do not want to go through this, but not what I will, you will, what you will. So you, just because you have a peace about something doesn't mean that it's God's will. And I'm not telling you that if you have a peace about something, that it's not a way to know what God wants you to do. But it's, first of all, it's not what Paul is saying here. So when he's talking about peace here, what does he mean by peace? Two theologians that help us in this, um, uh, helping us define what he means by peace here. These two very modern theologians, Timon and Pumbaa, they said, <laughs> they said, Akuna Matata. It means no worries for the rest of your days. It's our problem-free philosophy. All you got to do is wake up and eat bugs and hang out. No hyenas, no pride rock, no crazy uncle trying to kill you. It's all good. It's the picture of peace and calmness and tranquility. It's what happens between two countries that say we're no longer going to send rockets at each other. It's what happens between two neighbors who are going to stop fighting because one neighbor's dog keeps barking all night. It's what happens between two rival gangs that say we're no longer going to kill each other in the streets. It is this peace and tranquility that happens in a relationship. In fact, the word here for peace, it literally means to bind or join together that which has been separated. It's going from a state of friction and stress and strain to calmness and tranquility. So when did that happen for you and for me? When we met Christ. Question, do you have a friend right now that used to be your absolute mortal enemy? You hated them. She hated or he hated you and now you're best friends. Anybody have that story? I didn't, I didn't hate her, but she hated me. <laughs> It's very rare, very rare for you to be best friends with somebody that you absolutely hated. Can I tell you something? You are an enemy of God. I know you think, I've always been a friend of God. God's always been a friend. No, you were once an enemy of God. You were the one who was egging his house. You were the one making noise at night. You were the one who let your dog use the bathroom on his lawn and then didn't pick it up. You were the one who was making all the, that was you. You were enemy. In fact, let me tell you what Paul says. This is Colossians chapter one, verse 19. He says, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. 
and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by, here it is, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. He has made you a friend of God who you were once an enemy. You went from friend to foe. You went from looking outside of the house at dinner to being a special guest. That is what happened in my relationship and your relationship with God. And so we now have peace. We now have no worries. Now you're saying, I don't know if that's true because I still have worries. I still have issues in my life. I still have things that I, you know, at night I, I worry about. Here's the truth. You're probably right about that. There are things that you worry about. But can I tell you that the thing that you should be most worried about, you don't need to worry about anymore. Amen. The thing that you should most be worried about is the wrath of God that was aimed at each and every one of us before Christ. Amen. And now in Christ, we have reconciliation. So the worst thing that could ever happen to you has already happened to you because it happened to Christ. The, the very worst thing, think of the worst thing to die without Christ, that has already happened to you because of what Christ has done on the cross. We now have peace with God. We, it's just like those folks on the helicopter as they were leaving Jurassic Park. You remember that? Yes. It's quiet. It's serene. There's a Piano playing. And why do we feel that peace? Why? Because for the last hour, we've been seeing them chased by these extinct species of killers. And now they're moving away from Jurassic Park in peace, knowing that they're safe now. And that's what has happened in Christ. He has placed you in the helicopter of his grace. And now we are moving to the new heavens and new earth, away from sin, away from death, away from the grave. We have peace with God. But you see what he says there, though? He says, let this peace, it needs to rule in your hearts. What does he mean by rule? The word there for rule means it needs to act like an umpire. You know what an umpire does? An umpire or a ref, they call balls and strikes, pass interference, roughing the passer. They have control of the game or they judge the game. And he's saying that the peace of Christ needs to be like a judge or like a ref or like an umpire in your heart, which means when things come into your heart that do not promote peace and harmony in the body of Christ, that the peace of Christ blows its whistle, say, foul, out of bounds, flag on the play. It acts as an umpire. It controls. What should be the thing that controls the body of Christ? It should be peace. If we let the peace of Christ control us, there should be harmony in our body. Does that mean we'll be perfect? That there'll be no issues? Listen, there will always be contentions. There will also be disagreements. There will always be secret grudges. But the path you and I should always take is always the path to peace. What's the way that we should walk in? It's the way of peace because he says it's what we are called to. As members of one body, you were also called to peace. And it's, it's a peace that's not just individual. He's using the plural here. So he's talking about all of you. The peace of Christ should rule in our hearts as a community. That's real, true community. Because people say, oh, well, I don't want to, you know, make no issue. I don't want to, so I'll just, I'll just be fake. I'll just pretend like everything's okay. So you be in people's face, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you can't stand them. But the reason you do that is because I want to keep the peace. <laughs> That's not real peace. It's like the kid who throws all his stuff in the closet after his mom tells to clean his room, thinking that's real cleanliness. It's not real peace. See, when you do that, when you be fake and you're talking to people and you can't stand them, you don't deal with what you're dealing with, it, it doesn't lead to anything good. In fact, you're just trading short-term light for long-term darkness. 
So just be open. Be real. If you have a problem, deal with it. And let us have a community, an atmosphere of peace. Because when you think about the way the body is supposed to work, it's supposed to work in harmony. That's the picture of the body of Christ, right? That one part is like the hand and the finger and one part is like the foot. What would it be like if the hand was trying to fight the foot? Or the elbow was trying to fight the the rib? Or the hand was like, I want to figure out what my life is about. I want to do my own thing. (laughs) And they all had different ideas. Can you imagine me up here trying to preach and my whole body has different ideas? And I'm just like... (laughs) That's how some churches look. Welcome to Harmony Baptist Church where Jesus is Lord. That's, there's no way to live in the body of Christ for there to be disharmony and disunity and everybody doing their own thing. Amen. It used to be harmony in the body of Christ. There will be chaos and disharmony and nothing would get done. Here's the second thing. Not just the peace of Christ is that in you, but is the word of Christ in you. Look at it again. He says in verse 16, let the peace of Christ ruling your heart since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms hymns and songs from the spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts is the word of God dwelling in you richly what is the message of Christ or literally the word of of Christ. Put it simply, it's the Bible. Does the word of God dwell or live in you? Not just there for a few seconds. Does it live? Does it dwell? When we have Sunday dinner, there are people who come to the house and they're there only for a few hours and then they go. But there are other people who are there. They live there. They sleep there. They eat there. They, they do everything there. Those are the people who live there. They dwell there. In other words, That is how the word is supposed to dwell in us. It's supposed to stay and live, not just be there for a moment. And he says it needs to dwell in us us richly. Um, Charles Spurgeon, who was uh, a preacher, he's called the Prince of Preachers because he was just an amazing preacher. He wrote this. It's so good. He says, oh, that you and I might get into the very heart of the word of God and get that word into ourselves. As I have seen the silkworm eat into the leaf and consume it, so ought we to do with the word of the Lord. Not crawl over its surface, but eat right into it until we have taken it into our inmost parts. It is idle merely to let the eye glance over words or to recollect the poetical expressions or the historic facts, but it is blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until at last you come to talk in scriptural language and your very style is fashioned upon scripture models. And what is better still, your spirit is flavored with the words of the Lord. He later talks about John Bunyan and he says that he was so full of the Bible that his blood was bibline. In fact, I had, a, I had a rhyme in one of my songs that said, eat up the word of God, I know where the source is, and when you cut me, I bleed Bible verses. I want to be able to be the kind of person that if you were to cut me, you just see Bible coming out. Amen. Is that true of you? Do you let the word of God dwell in you richly? How does this happen? One, just by reading it. Amen. Do you read it? Amen. Some people be saying, I read the Bible, but you know what I always say? People be lying. <laughs> Do you actually read the Bible? Here's the thing. I don't know. You can say, I read it, but you don't. But it, it's been a blessing because some of you are on version. It's an app. And I can, if I'm your friend, I can sometimes see when you completed a, a Bible reading plan or you've completed something. And so I've seen people like Joanna. Joanna has completed her Bible reading program. Perion, last, last year he read through the whole Bible. In the whole year. And he didn't tell anybody, but I saw it. I mean, just reading God's word, just reading it. Do you read it? Number two, do you study it? Do you study it? We've, in our church, we've talked about the fact that the Bible is an ancient book. It's written thousands of years ago in a different culture, in a different time. And so because of that, we need to study it. We need to look into it, see what, what, what does it really mean? Because it's not in our time, it's not in our culture. So we got to figure out what's going on with it. 
Do you read it? Do you study it? Here's the third one. Do you memorize it? Last year, I asked some people if they want to memorize the Bible, and a handful of people said, yeah. So for the last year, we've been memorizing Scripture. We have, I think, about 15 Scriptures down, and they've been at it. And some of them, they wanted to quit. Yeah. <laughs> they said, "Get." Um, I don't think this is the Lord's will for me. I don't have a peace about this. <laughs> and we didn't let them. We said, no, you're not about to leave. We pulled them back in. Why? Because memorizing is important. It's an important thing. Lord, you're saying, well, I can't do it. I'm old. My brain don't work like that. I can't remember nothing. I'm just not that kind of person. It's not true. Let me prove it to you. If I were to say to you, I'll give you next Sunday a million dollars for every verse of the Bible you have memorized. <laughs> How many of you? Next week, you would come here and you would say, <clears throat> good morning, I'm going to be reciting Genesis chapter 1 through Revelation chapter 22. <laughs> I've also prepared maps and concordance. Here's, here's what the truth is, is that, yes, if you really want to do it, you can do it. And yet the word of God says your word is more precious than gold and silver. So God's word is more important, more precious than a millions and millions of dollars. And it's true isn't it true that um, some people, it's easier for them to do certain things? Like, you know, if you look at a piece of cake, you gain 10 pounds. And there's other people, they'll walk from here to their car and they'll lose five pounds. <laughs> now, what does that mean? That doesn't mean, well, I can't lose weight. I ain't mean, no, it, just, it just means you have to work harder. So it might be true that you don't remember things like you should, but the, but the reality is, that you just might have to work harder. But what does Paul say is the way we should allow the word to dwell in us richly? He says, do it through singing. Singing. You ever see um, patients who have dementia? They can't remember who they are. They don't know where they are. But when you start singing Amazing Grace, they know every single word. What is that? That is the power of music. The power that music has to trap words in your mind. It's what advertisers use. It's why they write jingles. Let's just see. Let's just, let's just take one for example. See if you can finish this. Like a good neighbor. State Farm is <laughs> Give me a break. Give me a break. I wish I were Oscar Mayer Wiener. That is what I really want to be. Look at that. When's the last time you saw one of those commercials? It's in your mind. I don't even have to give you the words. Someone said, Stay Farm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see how that works? Thank you. You see how that works with music? And here's the thing, too, about music, that you can say things in a way that helps you that talking can't do. You can pause. You can repeat words. If I was up here and I said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch <laughs> like me. You would call the ambulance. What's wrong with you? <laughs> but if we say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It's not weird anymore. And we can pause. We can grow. Last week we sang a song, um, um, hallelujah, God be praised. He's risen from the grave. This big epic part. If I came up to you and I said, he's risen from the grave. <laughs> you can't do that. It's weird. And these allow you to pause, to repeat, and to linger 
so that the word would dwell in you richly. How'd you learn your ABCs? It was song. So Paul says the way that we grow, the way that we get the word of God to dwell in us richly is through singing. I have a friend that says if a picture is worth a thousand words and a song is worth a thousand sermons. There is something about singing God's word that helps it to dwell deep within our hearts. And worship, it's a response to revelation. So when God reveals who he is, we respond in worship. It's why we've been singing at the end of the service, because God speaks to us through his word, and then we want to respond to him in worship. And what a wonderful way to do it through song. In the Bible, there are 400 references to singing and 50 of them are direct commands to sing. It's almost like it's written into the human DNA for us to sing. And you might say, oh, I'm not a great singer. The Bible doesn't say be a great singer. The Bible says make a joyful noise. Maybe for you, it sounds like a noise. It's still beautiful to God's ears. It might not be beautiful to his ears, but he he likes it. (laughs) Because God understands what beauty is supposed to sound like. But here's something that you cannot miss here that Paul's trying to say, that worship has a vertical and a horizontal aspect. Remember, he says, singing with gratitude in your hearts to God. But look at what he said before that. He says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. So what's happening when we sing? You are teaching and admonishing. Well, teaching and admonishing is for the pastor and for the ministers. No. You are called to teach. In fact, this word is the same word he used back in chapter one that says we teach and we admonish those, making them mature in Christ. It's what happens when as you are worshiping and as you're singing these songs, as I hear and as I see, I am being taught and I am being encouraged. It's It's what Janice taught us so well. Every Sunday, she would sit right here and she would be in pain. She would be not feeling the best. She would be in a bad way. And that music would start. Hey! (laughs) I'm like, Janice, you're back, you're back, you're back. And she would march up and down this. And when we saw it, we said, that's worship. Teaching us that... I'm going through a difficulty, but God is still worthy to be praised. Amen. So when I see you and I see you worshiping, I know you had a hard week. I know your children are driving you up the wall. I know they are. You saw up the wall, you spider man or spider girl. <laughs> I can see that, but I'm encouraged and I'm admonished to say, I need to continue in this walk. Amen. We teach and admonish. You know, we watch these um, epic movies, you know, where they have action and drama. I don't know if you know what really makes those movies go. It's not the action. It's not the dialogue. It's the music. I was watching the other day the end of Avengers Endgame, which is like the most epic moment in cinema history. But a guy, (laughs) he took all the music out. So it was just the dialogue and some of the actions. It's the most awkward thing I've ever seen. (laughs) It was no longer epic. It was just awkward because that music is what helps carry that emotion. So Paul says, let this word of God dwell in you richly through singing. Let me just say as I move to the last point, the, the singing part is not the point where we check out. It's in that moment that, and again, I know not all of us are, you know, big on singing, but can I tell you, you're teaching, you're admonishing, you're giving God praise, and you're allowing God's word to dwell in you richly. Don't don't miss. I remember back in the day, like people think like the sermon was the big thing, so they kind of come to church late, so they wouldn't have to see the hear the music. But man, that's that's one of the best parts of our time is we get to sing. And yeah, it's a little weird because we're behind masks and all that, but. Man, it's a privilege to be able to do that. So if the peace of Christ is in you and the word of Christ is dwelling in you, then what should come out of you? Gratitude, 
Look at he says in verse 15 at the end, he says, and be thankful. Gratitude in your hearts. Verse 17, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So three times in these three verses, Paul says it again and again and again. Give thanks, give thanks, do it with gratitude. Why would Paul say that? I think it's because Paul would believe that when someone, a man or a woman, understands what has happened to them, what has been given to them, they are filled with thanksgiving. When you know you have peace with God and there's no longer uh, enmity, you are no longer an enemy of God. When you know you have his word dwelling in you, what comes out of you? Gratitude. And, you know, sometimes when it comes to, you know, giving thanks, there are people who are horrible at it. There's a, there was a town called Evanston, Illinois, where there's a man there who worked in the company that helped save people uh, when they were in trouble on the sea. And it was 1860, and a ship ran ashore, and 17 passengers were in this frigid, frigid water. So this man, he swam out, and he saved 17 of these passengers. But in doing that, he had huge... Um, uh, detriment, damage to his health in doing that. And at his funeral, it was noted that not one of the 17 that he saved thanked him. Not one. Now in this morning, moment, how do you feel about those 17 passengers? You're like, man, you should have just left them in the water. You don't act like that. Jesus heals 10 lepers And only one comes back to say thank you. When you understand what has happened to you, you are filled with thanks. When you don't say thank you, it reveals an entitled, spoiled, selfish, ungrateful attitude. It's the attitude of selfish and sinful people. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 1. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is how sinful, ungrateful people act. God gives them sunshine and rain and, and all that. And what, how do they respond? Ungratefulness. And nothing makes me more mad than to see my kids to not say thank you. It was drilled into us when we were kids. You say thank you. You don't let somebody give you something you don't say thank you. And the, the, the difficulty that I'm having in trying to parent is I want my kids not to just say thank you because mommy and daddy's watching. Thank you. I don't want that. I want them to do it because they're truly grateful. I don't know how to do that. I thought about, I'll just give them one strawberry a week. <laughs> So whenever you give them food, they'll be, oh, thank you. <laughs> It'll be true gratefulness. But somebody said that, that's abuse, so I probably can't do that. So what's coming out of you this morning? I know what's in you, or what should be in you. What should be in us is the peace of Christ in us. Is the word of Christ dwelling in us. What's coming out of us? I think it's cool that we get to end our time of worship today by coming to the Lord's table. And I think it's interesting because one of the names for the Lord's Supper is the Eucharist. And Eucharist comes from a Greek word that just means thanksgiving. In fact, it's what Paul used in verse 15. It's a table of thanks. One person described it as the supreme act of Christian Thanksgiving. What are we doing when we come to the table? We're giving thanks and remembering what God has done for us in Christ and giving thanks for it. This morning we were getting ready and uh, my son was asking about, you know, communion and what is that and why we're doing that. And it was just, it blessed my heart to hear my wife explaining to him what it was. That it's not just, you know, when we were, when we were kids, it was like snack. And for him, he's like, oh, what, what, is, what is this? I don't understand. And to hear, try and explain, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it, because we're grateful and we're thankful for what Christ has done for us.
It's a supreme moment to give God thanks for what he has done for us. But it's not just a moment for us to give thanks because the Bible keeps telling us this, that you're not just supposed to be sitting here, that you're participating as a teacher. And during communion, you're also preaching. Did you know that? Listen to what Paul says. He says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's the same word that he used in, verse, in uh, Colossians 1, that he's the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone. We are proclaiming what Christ has done for us on the cross. And we're preaching, we're saying to the world, look at what he has done. But we're not just saying, look at what he's done. We're also looking to, to what he's going to do. Because Paul says, until he comes, we're waiting, we're hoping that the Savior that we celebrate at this table, that he will come back and take us to be with him forever in a new heavens and a new earth. He's coming to rid the world of sin and death and mourning and crying and pain. And it, it, it's at this table that we get to think about and give God thanks for all that he has done. Amen. So the pastor's going to come and ministers are going to come and they're going to lead us in our time in the Lord's Supper and I just want you to think the peace of Christ in me, the word of Christ is in me. And during this time that our hearts would be full of thanksgiving. So as pastor comes and leads us in our time, let's prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. Thank you for listening. If you would love to hear more sermons like this one or find out more about our church, please visit us at villagebaptisthome.org. Until next time, take care and God bless.